Happy Wealth Wednesday. Marissa, I'm so glad to have you here. It's been incredible to connect kind of through Eve's network of tools and community and all the things we've been doing, but then to realize this amazing step you've taken into the world of blockchain and this world of policy council at Blockchain Association. And so I'm really excited to dive in on how you made that switch and how it's all been um, you know, evolving and to kick us off, I would love if you could share where are you based right now and what are you up to these days? Sure. Well, first, thanks so much for having me. I was very excited to um, be asked to come on and I loved connecting with you. It was probably like a month ago, I guess. Um, so I'm very excited to be here, but I am based in Los Angeles right now. I've been here since I graduated college, actually. I went to college in Boston, but then came back. I'm from LA, so came back home. And the Blockchain Association is based in DC. So I do travel to DC a fair amount and, of course, go to the various crypto-related conferences all over the country. But based in LA, um, specifically, if you know LA, like Northeast LA and Highland Park, so that is where I call home for now. Work-wise, I'm policy counsel at the Blockchain Association. So the Blockchain Association is the largest uh, industry trade group uh, for the crypto industry. And we basically represent the industry in Washington, um, mostly doing federal policy, but we do work on some state issues and some international issues as well. And we're sort of like the voice for the industry. So we have relationships with people on the Hill and with various regulators. Um, and then we also are active in the courts through an amicus brief practice, uh, conceivably, you know, suing the regulators at some point, depending on what happens, um, you know, in the regulatory landscape. But that is just a brief overview of the BA. And my role, I oversee everything legal. So I oversee strategic litigation, which would include our amicus brief practice. And then um, also, like, whenever there needs to be some sort of legal analysis, if there's a proposed bill uh, or draft legislation or proposed regulation, I'll come in there. And um, we draft comment letters, like, in accordance with the APA when there's a proposed bill. So that's sort of like a high-level overview of my role. Um, 2023 is going to be a big year of education. So that's what we are, we're really focused on education uh, for the new members of Congress. And then I'm working on developing our strategy in the courts, um, which again would include like our amicus brief practice and potentially suing a regulator depending on how things shake out. So that's what I'm focused on. I love it. For those of us who may not know or are listening, what is an amicus brief practice? Good question. So an amicus brief, amicus means friend of the court, and it's an opportunity for a third party. So someone who's not the plaintiff and not the defendant to have a voice in the lawsuit and to basically provide the court with some extra context that they might not otherwise get from either the plaintiff or the defendant. So as a trade association, we help uh, educate the court about how a ruling on a particular issue could potentially have broader implications and like impact the industry in a broader way than just impacting the parties that are actually named in the lawsuit. I love it. Okay. Thank you for sharing. I just love yeah. to like, break down the acronyms and things that come up because you are totally an expert in this and um, not everyone may understand. So one of the other things I know it's, you know, we we talk about this here at Eve is just the empowerment of the feminine and like the ownership economy and of digital assets or just even in our own like wealth space. And obviously wealth can be uh, relationships. It can be about money. It can be about time. Uh, so kind of you can interpret this as you will based off of your life. But I love asking this question of just like where people got started in their own investment uh, space. So do you remember what your first ever investment was or what got you started? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's sort of a funny story. So my grandfather, he would he's no longer alive. But when he was alive, he would give my brother and I one share of Home Depot stock every year for her birthday. <laughs> Why and the reason why, yeah. why Home Depot, great question. 
So his business was, uh, he was basically like a broker for manufacturers to help get their products into stores like Home Depot. He had like a special affiliation with Home Depot and was particularly excited about that store. But that basically, like I remember when I was a kid, you know, and the stock listings would be listed like in the New York Times or the LA Times or whatever newspaper. And I would look it up and and I didn't really understand it, but that was sort of my introduction to that world. I love that. That's such a good story. It always comes, and that's why I love asking this question because it's so unique for every person. And sometimes you get these just really funny, great nuggets like Home Depot stock. Yeah. <laughs> And so then what got you into this space of law? You know, um, you, you did more traditional law and then now blockchain. Maybe you could talk about even that transition. So from like college, how do you even decide to become a lawyer in the first place? And then how do you decide to take this step into the world of this new emerging technology? Yeah, sure. So after college, I worked for two years at a branding and licensing agency. And I just felt very um, intellectually unfulfilled. And I was seeking, I, I always, I always loved school. So I knew that I wanted to go to graduate school and I was deciding between getting my master's in public policy, my master's in social work, and then a law degree. And ultimately I obviously decided to get a JD, went to law school. And I, after law school, I practiced litigation and like white collar investigations at um, two big law firms. And at one of them, I worked on an SEC enforcement action of a crypto company. So that was my intro to crypto. That was back in, I think it was the beginning of 2018 during the ICO, all of the ICO actions. And I just found it like incredibly interesting from a legal perspective, since there was really no precedent. And I could just see how this landscape like in the law was completely uncharted. So that was the intro to crypto. And I just kind of followed it ever since then. And then ultimately last, uh, the beginning of last year, I made a very conscious choice that I didn't want to be at a large law firm anymore. So I was trying to figure out what to do next. And I thought it would be interesting to get into crypto for, you know, the reason that it's just very uh, intellectually interesting to me. And I also think it marries um, both like it being interesting from a legal perspective and this emerging new technology. And then also there's like an impact angle, which is really important to me and helping reshape our financial system to become more equitable and not just the financial system, but like you know, web three more generally, and uh, like the, creating more individual ownership over our digital content um, and digital assets. So that part of it was just sort of like uh, motivated my soul. Um, so it was like the Mary of the impact and the intellectually interesting aspect of it. And then I saw the position at the Blockchain Association and Jake Chervinsky, who's our chief policy officer and my boss, he actually clerked for the same judge that I clerked for, but he was a few years ahead of me. And he actually interviewed me when I was in law school for my clerkship. So we were connected on LinkedIn and I reached out to him and then we just got to talking about the position and I joined the BA last May. Wow, what a cool story. I love how that happens really just like organically through like networks and things you never expect will take you to another place. Um, so what role do you feel like you play in the wealth space and why is it important? And maybe that may or may not feel like it applies fully, but I actually feel like being at the forefront front and lead of policy around blockchain ha does have a big uh, role to play in like access and democ democratized access um, of who gets Yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I think definitely a big role from a regulatory perspective and ensuring that this technology is uh, still able to develop and their like continued innovation is allowed. And I think, um, you know, there's a potential for certain regulations to really close off a lot of the technology if they're drafted in a certain way. So we work really, really hard to make sure that that doesn't happen and to make sure that blockchain technology can exist in the United States. So I think from that perspective, I have a role to just like ensure access. 
Absolutely. And like, obviously there's just so much noise going on in the, the, the world right now, especially the world of blockchain with, you know, the multiple bankruptcies, things that have happened um, with F FTX, with BlockFi, with Celsius. Um, knowing all of that, you know, what do you think is either the most exciting thing or like something that's really on your radar right now that you are, have learned that you would want others to know as you're kind of thinking about that? macro environment we're in yeah i mean it's definitely a tough environment and 2022 was like quite the year um and just like so crazy that i joined that this was my first year joining it and this is what happened um but i do believe that we're in this we've like entered the era of building and i think that a lot of the bad actors are being filtered out and we're really starting to refine the technology such that like we can keep building. And I think that's going to be the focus of this year and probably next year too. Um, and then in terms of what I've learned, I mean, I have dug a little bit just into the parallels between the beginning of the internet and the start of like blockchain technology and crypto. And I just find it fascinating, especially from a regulatory perspective, like when the internet first was, you know, gaining popularity there, the regulators tried to prevent um, people to use credit cards online. And obviously that is no longer the case. And like our entire lives, you know, revolve around being able to use a credit card online. And that's like such a core part of like how we interact with each other and with businesses. So there's other parallels too, but I just, I find that fascinating. And I sort of am like looking more into that history to understand like, what are the core principles that we can bring from that to protect innovation in this space? And then sort of relatedly, like the history of like the Renaissance and how, you know, during the Renaissance, there was this, the advent of the double entry accounting system, and it allowed for people to build wealth because they could have credit. Whereas before people weren't able to, to have credit because there was like no way to account for it. And I feel like we've entered this new renaissance where people can build wealth in like a systemically different way than what we're all used to. So that's what I'm like really excited about. And I think we're just at the beginning of it. I really love that. I think that we often miss out on these parallels and history and at least blockchain as I've seen it since like 2008. There's like kind of repetitive um, learnings that keep happening and it's partially because like the history doesn't feel as documented or, you know, it's too fun. Um, so knowing those things and even comparing to the past can be so powerful to help direct the future. Um, I want to just double down on this question a little bit more too, because I know it's probably really top of mind for a lot of people when you're thinking about those like third order effects, like third parties who are affected by decisions that might, might be made, um, from a regulatory standpoint, especially around like the players, like the block buys or the Celsius of the world, and especially around, um, staking and, you know, um, interest bearing products and all this like security stuff that's going on. Um, are there any like themes or things that are really top of mind for you on um, where you're starting to see regulatory like pushback that you feel like would have real third party effects and that, you know, the average person should be aware of, you know, as they're thinking about advocating for their own personal, you know, freedoms on value and transactions. So, you know, anyone listening yeah. can like keep that in mind for themselves. Yeah, sure. So I think um, there's a few things. One is like the regulators are always focused on consumer protection. And that's sort of the um, like reason that they give for wanting to limit this technology. And I think it's our job to help educate them about why this technology actually solves for some of the risks that you know, consumer protection related laws are designed to protect against. So that's one thing. And then another thing I think is like the balance between privacy and then, you know, the regulators and Congress want to protect national security. And I think our right to privacy, we have to like add, keep advocating for that because right now the government 
you know, with even just like in our traditional banking system, the government has a right to basically see all of our transactions because we have to do KYC, you know, when we sign up for a bank account. And I'm not saying that that shouldn't be the case, like that there should be no KYC, but it's just this balance between individual privacy and like financial privacy with protecting national security interests and protecting against illicit finance. So I think like the the goal of having privacy can be something that everybody you know, is concerned about. And then I don't know if your question also was related to like, what can people do to make sure that they're, that they're being safe, you know, dealing with this stuff, but happy to answer that. Not necessarily just safe, but that's definitely a key consideration. But even like, you know, I think we get a lot of questions of what role could they be playing now as even part of the legal processes, Mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of them are getting mail and the um, letters in the mail talking about if you had you know, deposits with any of these that you're part of now, like a bankruptcy proceeding, like you are right. technically part of that, which might be really unusual for the average person, um, you know, how they should be thinking about that, like, and, um, and maybe even the repercussions of that, you know, as we think about where this might go. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that asking questions is like always a good idea. And I have found that this space in particular, people are very, very open to answering like basic questions too. Um, But I think that, you know, it's like important to educate yourself and um, knowing that when you're in this space and doing uh, this kind, these kinds of investments, it is risky. So just being mindful that, you know, there is some risk just like naturally attached to involving yourself in something that it's regulated, but not in the same way that like bank transactions are regulated. So I think that should just like, you know, be in the front of somebody's mind when they're interacting in that way. Absolutely. And is there a person or a company in the space that's really inspiring you right now? Um, it's a good question. I I love the like decentralized social. So like Ave with Lens is doing some cool stuff. I still haven't like quite figured out how to use it, but I do have my Lens handle. But I just love the idea of you know Twitter or Facebook. I I don't even have like Facebook or Instagram. I do have a Twitter, but I love the idea of nobody owning what we post online. I think that's like such a core part of what we're doing. Um, And then, you know, like decentralized finance is, is fascinating. Like the idea that we don't need an intermediary to, to like complete a transaction is revolutionary. Um, So, you know, Uniswap is huge in that space, um, but there's a ton of other, um companies too and the DeFi education fund does a ton of amazing advocacy work specifically related to DeFi. um let me think about what else maggie at shefi her work is amazing in terms of educating help educating the community she's helped me a ton just like learn the tech um Mm -hmm. and i'm still learning a ton like it's just never ending especially since it's constantly evolving Um, I think Lee, she's a partner at Variant. She has some amazing uh, publications that she's written about decentralization and the ownership economy. So I would definitely follow her and Variant's work too. I love all of those. I'm a big fan of everything that you just mentioned. Um, And Ave does have a pretty strong uh, regulatory um, fund, or I think, is that the DeFi Education Fund that you referenced? Is that connected to Ave? No, not directly connected, um, but they, so I think, I don't think they're directly connected. The DeFi Education Fund is based in DC and the BA works very closely with them, um, but they're sort of like independent advocacy, the kind of similar to what we do, but they're not a membership organization and they're solely focused on DeFi. I love it. So cool. We'll be following all of these things. So um, any advice that you would give to someone getting started? I actually would love to ask this even from like lawyers, like other fellow lawyers who might be listening to this, if they wanted to get involved in this space or participate in some way, either personally or in their career, like how can they get started? 
Yeah. So, well, I guess one is don't be afraid to ask questions, but just like deep dive into the, um, into reading about it and learning about it. There's a ton of great resources out there in like communities to try to learn as much, you know, as possible about this space. I think if you are a lawyer and you're at a firm, I would try to work on some crypto matters or at least work on some securities matters or commodities like CFTC related matters. Um, or if you're a deal side lawyer, I am i don't have any experience like on the deal side, but maybe try working on some like venture related deals so you can get experience in like that ecosystem, which obviously is hugely impactful um, in building crypto now. So, and then there's some good online communities for lawyers. Like there's a discord channel. I think it's like blockchain barristers potentially okay. if I'm getting that right. Um, Lex Dow is, um, like the Lex punk army. Um, they're a group of lawyers. They try to create open source, uh, like legal uh no, it's like an open source repository repository of legal um resources um but i would like connect with some of the big lawyers in the space and like most of them are on twitter but if you read about the law in this area just look at like who's writing whatever article and try to connect with them i think people i found people are very very open to having those initial conversations of like, how did you get into this space? And um, how, like, what would you recommend for me? I love that. That's such great advice. How can we keep in touch with you and Blockchain Association as you're, you know, advocating and putting out um, proposals in the world? Yeah, so the Blockchain Association's on Twitter. I think it's Blockchain ASSN, but I mean, if you search it on Twitter, it'll come up. And then I'm also on Twitter, MT Koppel. And I also have a Substack that's not crypto related at all. It's like me writing about personal development, but mm -hmm. um, I can share the link with you for that too. It's called Becoming Undefined. <laughs> I love it. We, I want to follow all these things. And I think that's what's so amazing about these interviews and getting to know everyone in the space. It's like we're all multi multi-dimensional beings that, you know, could do law by day and personal development <laughs> and substack. Totally. So I'm here for it. And I can't wait to read and follow all of these things. Marissa, thank you so much for being part of this world, for jumping into the world of crypto, for doing the advocacy work that you do, and just being part of this interview today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. This was fun.